Imagine you live somewhere you're only allowed to eat food if someone else approves. You're only allowed to sleep in a bed if someone else approves. You're only allowed to go outside if someone else approves. And you can only get approval for any of these things if you work for the person who can approve them, on that person's terms, as long and as hard as they say. You're not allowed to complain, or else the person will withhold approval for life's necessities, and you will die of starvation or exposure. You have kids, you have friends, you have family, but you're only allowed to see them after work, if the person in charge lets you have enough time after work before you need to go to bed and wake up and start all over again. And you're expected to be grateful for all of it sounds dystopian, doesn't it? And yet, how is it different from our world? This isn't some sci-fi future. This is your life under capitalism. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Before we go any further, I'd like to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Gord VPN. If you're a generic looking white guy like Gord, this is the VPN for you. One other thing, I just started a podcast a couple of weeks ago called It Has to Be Cast, you know, kind of named after this channel, of which I make a new episode every Sunday, so you can find that anywhere you get podcasts. One thing that I mentioned in last week's episode was I really don't like using the word slave or slavery to describe workers under capitalism because there are an estimated 40 million people around the world in forced labor who are under the constant threat of violence if they run away. And that's what we usually call slavery. And I don't want to diminish their suffering. The thing is, our servitude as laborers under capitalism isn't fundamentally different. It depends on the job, of course, which itself depends a lot on the personal finances of the worker. When you're working 10 or 12 hours a day, getting paid just enough to survive, forced to come back in every day, the lines between slavery and the labor market begin to blur, as does everything else. After all, one of the main features of slavery is being forced to work. In a capitalist system like this, uh, we, we have to have money to survive, because all the means of survival require money. If you run out of money, well, you won't get whipped, but you will get kicked out of your home and denied food, left to die in the streets. So the threat of pain and suffering is still there. And we know that, we know that, deep down, which is why we're so afraid of poverty. Most people don't have the means to survive without a paycheck, so most people are forced to work under the threat of homelessness. When you sign that employment contract, you're under duress. Right-wing so-called libertarians, like I used to be, assume that when I object to the employer-employee relationship, I'm saying you, they shouldn't be allowed to trade labor for money. Uh, no, no one says that. The problem with their thinking is they ignore all historical context, and they don't analyze how the system actually works. They assume capitalism is inherently meritocratic, which again, if you look at history and how, how everything works, is clearly untrue. It was huge amounts of violence that led to the concentration of ownership of capital or the means of production, and thereby most of the money in the hands of a few people, even though they were built and are worked by lots of people. And it takes huge amounts of violence to maintain this system. There's no meritocracy. It didn't take some uncommon genius to create all that wealth. It took forced labor. Look up primitive accumulation, if you don't know what I mean, and you could read the book in the description. But the same goes for today. The supposed business geniuses of today just 
have lots of money so they can hire all the best people. That doesn't make them smarter than you. The problem is, a few people own everything, so they control everything, including government, media, etc., and the rest of us are forced to work for them. It's necessarily an extremely unequal relationship. They offer us money in return for our labor, as if they deserved it, when really they owe us. Everything should be commonly owned. Because everything we have has been built by billions of people throughout history. And in the present, too. And you couldn't just assign ownership to some of them. It's too complicated. Every invention comes on the back of an earlier one. Every company is built by multiple people. All wealth is created by workers. Everything should be owned in common. But instead, we live under capitalism. A system where a few people own, and most people spend their whole lives doing whatever the owners want. Capitalism could be described as a human rental racket. Under slavery, slaves are bought and sold. Under capitalism, workers are rented. They work for a business for some time at a wage and on terms both set by the employer, unless of course, they use the term unskilled labor, in which case the wage is so low, it's set by the government. The entire working class is at the disposal of the capitalist class, or the owners of capital. Unemployment is important in such a system, because without unemployment, the capitalist class would have no one new to bring in to work the machines. The obvious difference with slavery is employment is temporary. However, when people argue you're free to quit, therefore it's fundamentally different from slavery, they fail to acknowledge you don't quit the system. You quit your current boss, and you trade it for another, under the same old threat of poverty. Telling someone, just get another job, or learn new skills, or change your attitude, man, does nothing to address that. In theory, workers could start bidding wars by withholding their labor, either by going on strike, or in the way that's kind of happening now in the U.S., as workers are refusing minimum wage jobs and employers are forced to raise their wages. In response, you may have noted that employers are taking to social media to complain about how no one wants to work when the truth is they just don't want to break their backs for $7 an hour and an ungrateful boss. But employers will never raise wages high enough to pay the full value of the work done, because then they wouldn't make a profit. And profit is the only purpose of the corporation. And your only purpose in working for the corporation is to create value for it. You might have figured out, or you might have heard me say, your whole life is planned for you. Your purpose is to help some corporation with its purpose. You train your whole life to be a worker. Even in elementary school, you're preparing to serve the market. You spend most of your waking time as a child doing schoolwork, even though it's mostly worthless, because our rulers just want us to get used to bowing to authority and having no time for ourselves. You go to trade school or university so you can serve the market more effectively by specializing. You would think such big groups of people learning together could devise some alternative to the existing system. But no one even suggests it. Instead, we enter and leave those institutions knowing our purpose is solely to feed the market. We ask kids, what do you want to be? Which translates from propaganda as, how do you want to serve the market when you grow up? Which means we expect them to plan for their servitude and to spend most of their waking time working toward it. How could anyone get out of this pattern if it's drilled into us from the age of five? We ask adults, what do you do? Which means, how do you serve our master, the market? 
We even ask people, what's your dream job? As if our highest aspiration should still center on work and the market. How could we not be slaves when our imaginations are so limited? The people on the right who always talk about their freedoms never bring up the workplace. We have no freedom under capitalism. You're not free at work. You do what they tell you. All the time we spend working for someone else's time, we aren't doing what we want. Institutions will kick you out if you don't toe the line, so we're limited in what we can say, too. You have to get there on time, even if it doesn't actually matter, and you might have to stay late, even if you're not compensated for it. You have to dress the way they tell you to, you do what they tell you to for as many hours as they say, and they monitor you every moment to see if you're complying with the contract you signed under duress. You're not allowed to tell the truth. You know that. The interview forces you to lie about why you want the job because you aren't allowed to acknowledge the basic reason, needing money. You have to pretend you love the work and that the purpose of the company is what its marketing pretends rather than to make money. And that pretense doesn't end after the interview because you have to appear sufficiently happy anytime the boss looks at you or you'll get called into the office and disciplined and threatened with firing. So when people try to associate capitalism with freedom, I just don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, you can have a little freedom, but only after work. It's just like people who think we give up all rights and freedoms when we're in an airport. Because, you know, 9-11, 20 goddamn years ago. There's always an exception to when you're allowed to be free. I think the only freedom these right-wingers actually care about is the freedom to own a business and have more money than anyone else. <laughs> Not very inspiring. I say, after work. Really, there is no after work. Work never ends. You work all day, including before and after the hours you actually get paid for. Commuting is work. Waking up early is work. Rushing around in the morning to get to work on time is work. Going to school in order to become employable is work, too. Your life is designed for you to be a worker. Even though we've been promised a life of luxury or just relaxation, that's only available to a small percentage of the population. Just like heaven was available to everybody, supposedly for doing hard work in this life. I mean, only that tiny percent of the, of the population can have anything that we really aspire to, right? The rest of us have wages. If you rely on wages or a salary, you're dependent on your employer, even though your employer might cast you aside for whatever reason. And the thing about wages is, it's never enough to get out of more labor. You want to retire early? You have to own stuff. A wage is never enough to retire. For most people, it's just enough to survive. For lucky people like me, I have a little left over so I can buy a little fun now and again. I think of it as renting my freedom. Wages are decided by employers, not in collusion, but as a market. That's why it makes sense to talk about market wage. Market wage means the lowest amount they think you will accept. Slaves get food and shelter. Wage laborers get just enough money to afford food and shelter. We're all slaves to the market, and there aren't many exceptions. Even self-employed people... Of course. They still have to look for customers and adjust prices and hire people to serve the market. It's not about being owned by one corporation, but by the market or the capitalist class as a whole. Your job is to serve the market, whoever your employer is. If you don't, you go bankrupt. Even homemakers? Yep. 
The job of a homemaker is essentially to support a breadwinner. A homemaker is someone who works at home only and doesn't get paid because they can't work or because the breadwinner makes enough that they currently don't have to. Because they don't get paid, they're dependent on the breadwinner, making them, as James Connolly said, the slave's slave. Even employees of the state? Yep. States exist to create and serve markets, among other reasons. Bureaucracy is just another oppressive institution that supports the capitalist system, just like war, white supremacy, patriarchy, police, propaganda, and so on. State employees still receive a wage. You still follow orders and rules. You still leave work feeling tired and empty. The corporation's actions revolve around satisfying an insatiable market, and the state's job is to satisfy an insatiable corporation, along with itself and its favorite lobby groups. Even bosses? Of course. Bosses, directors, executives, etc. all still have to do what the market expects of them. They have to find the most efficient way to extract value from the labor of their employees. CEOs and other high-ups, they're doing even more work than ever. Don't even get why. Although, I would say if you have millions of dollars and you're still working, your job is your hobby. Either way, rich people are working more, even the rich. So why even bother getting rich? To get a nicer bunker on Mars next to Jeff and Elon? People think of the market as having this magic that leads to efficiency in iPhones and stuff. But that's because it forces everyone to work for it. If you can get millions of people to work long hours for low pay, you can make a lot of widgets and raise the GDP. But what's the cost? Most of our waking time, in other words, you know, our lives, plus our freedom, our mental health, and maybe most importantly, nature itself. Because we all understand deep down that we're slaves to the market, we don't question even the worst jobs. You can throw people in jail all day and turn around and say, I'm just doing my job. You can fire a missile at a wedding in Afghanistan, kill 20 people, then go home and sleep well because someone told you it was for freedom. So that's what you tell yourself, along with, gotta pay the bills. Gotta feed my family. So what if it involves destroying other people's families? The market demands, so we serve without question. So we're trapped. What is the way out? Well, we know the individual way out of slavery, to buy your freedom. So everyone wants to get rich. But we can only get out of this shitty life by making money, which usually means using other people and keeping them in servitude. As a result, only a few of us can ever get rich. It makes us into crabs in a bucket. We can get out if we use other people as stepping stones, making sure they stay poor and indentured. Or we could find a collective way out. There are certain things the market requires to function. It needs money. It needs to commodify everything. In other words, turning things once available to all into goods and services you have to pay for. And it needs force to hold it all together. I say we remove the linchpins. We need money, right? Well, what if we replaced it with a gift economy? A gift economy means providing things to each other without requiring people to prove they can afford it. That's about it, really. Although, for details, you can check out the links in the description. The more food we grow and distribute to our neighbors, the more homes we build for homeless people, the more we educate kids in the community instead of in the school, the less we feed the market. 
We could take everything out of the hands of the market and corporations if we can provide it without money. It takes a lot of collective effort, but to me it's much more interesting than getting rich and leaving everyone else behind. We can eliminate any need there might once have been for police through mutual self-defense. We have no use for parliaments and congresses when we can make decisions for ourselves in groups of whoever is affected. And we don't need corporations when we can organize with people all over the world to get things done. When we are no longer forced to use money, we'll actually come up with other kinds of arrangements. Probably all kinds of different arrangements. Like gift economies, maybe some kind of rules behind them. We'll see. <laughs> and if we were wrong and money was actually useful for something, we'll be free to bring it back voluntarily. We can get out of our condition through learning and organizing and resisting and treating each other as equals. We need each other. We don't need masters.